Our speaker uh, this evening is, uh, is Sir Desmond Swain, and uh, it's lovely to uh, welcome you here, uh, Sir Desmond, uh, with your, your wife, Moira, on your 33rd wedding anniversary. So uh, many congratulations oh. for that. <laughs> now, uh, before I allow Sir Desmond to speak, I'm going to give you 10 interesting facts about him, very, very briefly. But of course it could all be rubbish because it was on the Wikipedia page, but, uh, <laughs> but I, think, I, think it's a, it's, I think it should be okay. Uh, he's MP for New Forest West since 1997, and uh, he has a very handsome majority uh, in that seat, so there must be a lot, lot of Conservatives in this area. Um, according to Wikipedia, he studied theology at the University of St Andrews, and we've just been talking about that. So we have something in common, because uh, I studied theology as well, um, back in those days um, at Kent University. Uh, he then went on to teach economics at Charterhouse School and Rekin College. Um, he was an IT systems manager at Royal Bank of Scotland. Uh, he's a major in the Territorial Army and was posted to Iraq in 2003. He was Parliamentary Private Secretary to David Cameron. He was Minister of State for International Development. He's been Vice Chamberlain of the Household. I have no idea what that is, but it sounds very exotic. Um, he, he was also Lord Commissioner of the Treasury, another exotic post which sounds very important. Um, and he was knighted in 2016 for political and parliamentary service. So those are my ten, ten facts about you, Sir Desmond. Um, so he's going to talk uh, to us for five or ten minutes about libertarianism. So will you please give Sir Desmond a warm welcome? Well, thank you for that um, comprehensive welcome and for your hospitality. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, or comrades as I'd prefer to call you, <laughs> comrades, the first political philosophy, work of philosophy that I read was Friedrich Hayek's Road to Serfdom, uh -huh. followed swiftly by the rather more substantial tome, his Constitution of Liberty. And for those of you who've read that work, you'll find towards the back of the, the book, there's a chapter entitled, Why I Am Not a Conservative. Oh. And it was on reading that that I realised that I was a conservative and not a libertarian. Uh, I have the fondest uh, regard for the libertarian streak in my party that comes uh, principally from the liberal unionists that joined it and with a tradition going back uh, to the Whigs. But I am not myself from that stable. I regard myself as a church and Queen Tory. If I have a philosophy, it's one that could not be more antithetical to humanism than the one that I hold. <laughs> and so it will be interesting to see whether we can have any practical common ground, however we might differ in terms of philosophy. My philosophy is this, it's the biblical one, the radical depravity of man that can only be addressed by the initiative of our Creator in his redemptive work. Nothing could be more different than a humanist appreciation of the dignity of humanity and the possibility of progress. Nevertheless, I conduct a surgery weekly and people come to see me with all sorts of problems. And whilst I have the, I attach great importance to liberty, I attach even greater importance perhaps to order. A disproportionate amount of my time is spent dealing with neighbour disputes, where people's liberty is unrestrained to the extent that they are careless or thoughtless with respect to their neighbour's right to enjoy their property. But worse, for a significant proportion of people, it's almost as if they set out to make their neighbours' lives a misery. And that imbues me with a desire to see the state take firm action to maintain order, that in the words of Cranmer's prayer book, we might be godly and quietly governed. A concept 
almost tested to destruction during the Commonwealth that ran from the early 1640s, uh, 1640s to about 1660, with at one stage Cromwell turning round in despair and asking, if I were to arm one in ten, would that be enough? It wasn't enough. Perhaps he should have ditched the godly bit and stuck with the quietly bit of order. But if you accept, as I do, that there has to be a significant power in the state to restrain our liberty in order to ensure good order, what is the mechanism by which we maintain the balance? I put it to you that the mechanism is rather obvious. It's consent. And let's just test that principle against that issue of which I've acquired a certain notoriety in recent weeks, namely the wearing of face coverings, which I described in the House of Commons as a monstrous imposition. And a number of, a number of um, constituents have written to me very helpfully to point out that there is no difference in principle between being required to wear a face covering and being required to apply a seatbelt when you get into the car. Now let's put aside any issue about whether face coverings are effective or not. Let's simply accept the argument at face value that if I were to wear a face covering, it would protect me and it would protect you. A highly questionable contention, but nevertheless, let's accept that. Should I be merely encouraged to wear a face covering? Uh, should I be persuaded or should I be required to wear one? And the argument is, well, look, 30 years ago or so, we were required to wear seatbelts in cars. And there was an argument at the time about this being an intrusion by the nanny state into our liberty. And it was unnecessary and that we should just get on with it. And we did. And now you get into your car automatically and you put your seatbelt on. And if you don't, it's not because you're resisting and showing your, uh, your will to uh, not to abide by the legal requirement. It's simply because you've forgotten. A little red light will come on on the dashboard and remind you. So, Mr. Swain, what on earth is the fuss that you're making about this? You know, just shut up, belt up and stop making a fuss. I put it to you, comrades, that the case of the seat belt and the case of the, the face covering could not be more different. You'll recall, or you might recall, uh, when we had the campaign that preceded the requirement to wear a seat belt, there was a public information campaign to try and persuade us to do so. Do you remember? clunk click every trick trip fronted by no less than Jimmy Savile <laughs> and when it didn't work too many people were not wearing their seat belts legislation was introduced to require us to do so and there was a row there was a public debate and there was primary legislation in Parliament and a vote and we were required to wear seat belts but those people who resisted accepted the result because they consented to the democratic process by which the decision was made. And we all do that. Some of you may vote Labour, but nevertheless you consent to be governed by a Conservative government because you participated in a democratic process that gave rise to that outcome, however fair or unfair you might regard it as being. Nevertheless, those were the terms on which it was accepted. The people who opposed seatbelts felt that they had had their say. Their case had been made, even if they lost. So we now come to the face covering. We have been subjected in the last few months to the most extraordinary incursions into our individual liberty. We have been told who we may meet, when we may meet them, where we may meet them, what we must wear when we do so. 
Where was the debate? Where was the case made against this? So when a minister announced in the House of Commons that we would by law be required to wear a face covering on penalty of a fine, there was no debate. I was allowed to ask a question. 40 questions followed that statement. My question was what consultation has there been with the police who will have to enforce this monstrous imposition? That was the only voice of dissent that was made on that day. I, as a political representative in a democracy, have not voted on any occasion for any of these constraints on our liberty. That's the difference between wearing a seatbelt and the legislation that we've had during this crisis. The government rules by order, by diktat, by decree, under powers granted to it in 1984 in the Public Health Act. George Orwell was extraordinarily prescient in choosing that year as the title for his dystopian novel. Now you may say that these are all trivial things and they're all for our benefit. When was there a dictator ever in the history of mankind that didn't think his regime wasn't for the benefit of people? But nevertheless, these are relatively trivial things taken on their own. My warning to you is simply this. Ruling by decree is very convenient for ministers and governments, and it may well become habit forming. You have been warned. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sir Desmond, for that stimulating uh, start to our discussion. <laughs> so um, we now do have uh, 20 minutes or so for questions, comments, no missiles, please. <laughs> uh, Aaron at the back there, yeah. Aaron, what's your question? I'm definitely going to get in there. Um, yeah, OK, well, it's, it's a public health thing, and I think um, given if you were sat in cabinet room or the chorus or anywhere in there, he's not going to say, let's destroy the economy by wearing face masks. He's going on the best advice from the best minds in the scientific and medical field. And thus, I think if it had been put to a vote in the 650 comments, you'd have 630 people saying, absolutely, this is the sensible thing to do. Uh, wearing a face mask, I'm not wearing a face mask to protect me, I'm wearing it to protect you. That's the difference. The seatbelt, if you die, that's, that's fine. But it, when you went not wearing a mask, that's the other people's uh, uh, risk that you're doing. Well, I, I thank you for making the point for me, because that's you. precisely... If you're so confident that the democratic will would be... Um, uh, would result in the legislation to require us to wear masks, why not put it to the test? And then those of us who feel very strongly about our liberty being infringed would have accepted the result in the way that people accepted the issue with respect to um, uh, face ma uh, with respect to uh, seat belts. It would not have taken more than a one and a half hour debate on a statutory instrument in both houses to have had a positive, uh, an affirmative resolution on the issue of face masks or uh, on any of the issues that have been imposed on us. So, and I accept what you say about the government not seeking to be unpleasant to us um, uh, and doing it for the best possible reasons. Although I question some of those reasons and the wisdom of some of them, but that's not somewhere where I want to go at the moment. I just want to deal with the principle of democratic consent and decision making. And I think it's entirely proper that the government should ask us, should ask its elected parliament about the laws that it's going to impose however eminent the science and the advice on which it's based we are governed by democratic decision making by people who have been elected to represent the people not people who believe that they have a right to do so on the basis of their scientific knowledge okay let's bring simon in simon um well, so I was very interested to Desmond to hear your uh, attack on libertarianism, 
because some of us feel that maybe the current government um, is is very much in the mould of um, a, 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 the trend with Donald Trump and some other leaders towards a neoliberal view of economics. Um, sort of really let the market rip, it doesn't matter if very wealthy people don't pay taxes, just the market will sort everything out. Um, so I'm sort of curious where you stand in, the, in, in, in this sort of economic debate where you know and also perhaps to mention where you were on Brexit because uh, a long part of the neoliberal business seemed to be we don't want all these rules, we just want to let the market rip and the result will be good for everybody. Well, um, uh, uh, let's, let's finish with the, the point that you've just made. Uh, and I have been an enthusiastic Brexiteer since I campaigned to leave the common market in 1975. And it's simply on that issue that you put your finger on. It's nothing to do with the economic constraints and rules that we could quite easily choose to impose ourselves on ourselves should we wish to do so. It's a question of being governed by people whom we do not elect and who we could not remove. That was the issue on which I stood on Brexit. Question of basic democracy. But let's not, let's not go over all that ground mm. again. <laughs> but to come back to the, my, my, my economic outlook, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I am very much in the economic liberal uh, side of the argument. I believe in, in, in free enterprise and as little constraint. Of course, there has to be order. There has to be a regime to ensure that people are treated fairly and properly. But my argument there is that we have a parliament that is quite capable of doing that and providing those c constraints uh, without having to go to supranational uh, organisations and bodies. So, so just one very brief supplementary. When we had the great banking crash uh, about 10 years ago, uh, there were many commentators who said, well, uh, Reagan and Thatcher started this process of the big bang, the great deregulation, um, governments losing control of their currencies, let it all go into a global melting pot. Um, it doesn't worry you that that's where um, extreme liberal economics uh, can leave one. If the regulatory regime is properly enforced and properly made, uh, the changes that actually led to the, 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 the expansion in credit into the subprime market were made actually long after Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher had been put to bed that took place, those changes in the rules, certainly as far as the United Kingdom is concerned, took place uh, under Gordon Brown. I was in the, the Treasury of the Royal Bank of Scotland, and I recall, you know, the, the man from the Bank of England would come every day to interrogate the dealers as to exactly what the positions were. All that changed in the early 20, uh, 2000s, and it was that liberalisation, I accept it was a liberalisation, a change in the in the regulatory regime that led to you know a wholesale um, expansion of credit that was well it subsequently turned out to be disastrous. But my argument would be well, you know, we we should have stuck with the rules we had and the regime for imposing those rules. These things can be done. Okay, David, Sir Desmond, I, you may know more than me, but I thought there was still legislation extant on the books dating from Victorian times to impose quite draconian powers on us all under the Public Health Acts that arose when, you know, things like smallpox and cholera were fairly common and the state could impose quite dramatic things on people just to protect the whole population. And I, 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 my understanding was, having worked in the pollution field, that those things were still around in the statute book? It's not an area of my expertise, but my brief acquaintance with the history of that period that was that the government didn't take many draconian actions to um, deal with cholera and other ep epidemics. Um, but even had they, I'm pretty sure that those 
that legislation would have been reviewed and incorporated into the 1984 Act. It's certainly under the 1984 Act, not the, the Coronavirus 2020 Act, because that was that was what, what you know when when the uh, legislation was put before us, and I spent a weekend reading this 400-page piece of legislation that we were about to empower the government with. And I read through it, and I was reasonably satisfied that there was nothing horrendous in it. The only power that I could find that they were being given was the power being given to police officers and border officials to require someone to enter quarantine. Then, when the next thing is, we discover that there's an announcement that we're going to, going to go into lockdown and you will have to remain in your own home bar for one of four excuses that you are entitled to leave it for, I thought, crikey, have I been utterly remiss in reading the legislation and finding that, why didn't I speak against this bill and vote against this bill? It was only subsequently, having made that study, that I came across the fact that actually the government had not used the Coronavirus Act to impose all this legislation. It comes from the 1984 Public Health Act. But I, I really don't know enough about the subject to... A, to answer your question in detail. Go on. Hi. Um, I've got a lot of sympathy actually with what you're saying in that the government um, has, I mean, even on the face masks, uh, they uh, were saying until quite shortly before this, uh, this, as you put it, draconian measure was taken, um, that face masks were not, they were not encouraging people to wear them. So, so I, I, I agree with that. All I would say, though, is I'm surprised that as an MP you think that this is the most important issue around. I would have thought, for example, that the fact that you voted over 50 times to cut welfare payments is a much more important thing to debate than whether we wear face masks. There's a time and a place to debate everything. Yes. But I was asked today to address libertarian issues. Are we? Yes. <laughs> okay. I was given the subject. I'm a member of the, I'm a member of the Work and Pension Select Committee. I was, when I was first elected, a member of the Social Security Select Committee. So I accept that I probably have a, a diametrically opposed view to you um, with respect to, to welfare. I'm quite happy in another yeah, forum yeah, yeah. To, to, no, no, to address no, that. But taking the point that you started with, that's the area I didn't want to get into of questioning the the um, validity of the requirement. I say, let's just accept that it's a good thing. The question is the process and the diminution of liberty in that process. But you make a point which I think the government may well have correctly put its finger on. If you look at the polling, the polling is very much across different support for different political parties and it's across different age cohorts. It's pretty consistent across all those different groups. And it's 60-40 in favour of the government's line of masking up, requiring people to mask up. Mm. I accept that I speak for a minority, but it's important that minorities have their voices heard and their case made. I think the estimate that the government made was irrespective of any difference it might make to your health. This was an economic concern. The footfall that we hope to see after we reopen the shops and reopened enterprises has not materialized. People are still largely, or, or a large number of people are still relatively scared and staying at home. Mm. And the belief was, as I see it, that if we make everyone wear a mask, those people who would otherwise stay at home will feel sufficiently safe to come out and start spending money again and get the economy going. I think that was the equation, and in and, and which case they may well have been right. Yes, well, could, could I just, um, yeah. um, if you, if you, if, if we're not talking about whether it's right or wrong, I mean, it's, uh, suppose that it were right, suppose that it were the case, because the, it's not, people don't wear face masks to protect themselves, mm. unlike with the clunk click thing. People wear face masks to protect other people. Because you know the evidence, such as it is, is that um, it it does very little to protect the person wearing the face mask, but it does help to stop the transmission outwards to other people. And if that is the case, then um, surely uh, it it it's a question of morality that if if there's a significant chance 
uh, that people can spread the disease to somebody else by uh, and, and and that there's a significant reduction by wearing a face mask, then it's a good thing to do. I accept that that your process issue um, that it should have been voted through. That that's the point. I mean, if if it is morally correct to wear a face mask. Perhaps we ought to have tried to persuade people beforehand to do so voluntarily. Yes, yes. But nevertheless, if we've come, arrived at a position that it is in, your, in the interest of others that you wear a face mask, then that doesn't alter the requirement that it ought to have been properly yeah, put through enough. in a democratic process. But I take issue with you on the seatbelts. I remember quite clearly one of the arguments that was made for wearing seatbelts was the cost to the community oh. of dealing with the injuries as a mm. consequence and also people flying from the back seat and killing people in the front seat yeah. as a consequence of not being bucked in. So I think all these things are shades of grey. Yeah. Simon. Uh, Sir Desmond, um, I don't know the details of the 1984 Public Health Act uh, any more than I, I think you do, um, but generally we situations where this, a Secretary of State is given a power to impose regulations, there is also a power that they have, that uh, the Parliament has an opportunity to scrutinise and challenge within a certain time period. Uh, do you happen to know if that is the case in your particular question on the coronavirus regulations? So, so there, are two, there are two ways that a government can make orders. Um, there's the, the, the affirmative resolution, which requires, so the government is given power in primary legislation to make orders on a specific issue. Uh, the narrower the constraints on the orders, that, that, the details that they can make, the better. But nevertheless, on that procedure, there has to be a affirmative resolution in each House of Parliament. You cannot amend it. You can't change it, you have to vote for it or against it. So it's different from primary legislation, it's a short procedure. The other way in which, built into the legislation, a minister can be given that power, and it's down to the, the black and white on the face of the bill as to which it is, is the government has the power to make the regulation and parliamentarians then have the time period that you refer to, to, pr to enter a prayer that the regulation be revoked. In other words, the minister has the power to make the legislation and apply it from today, but members of parliament can pray, in the sense of entering a prayer, a motion, that that regulation be revoked. But it's up to the government as to whether to give those people who have entered a prayer a debate and opportunity to oppose it. So when it comes to negative resolutions, the power for Parliament is very, very weak. And of course, this is something to which members of Parliament need to be alive, because we pass bills every day, giving governments more and more power to make the law by regulation subsequently, which Parliament will has increasingly less opportunity to alter. That's why I left you with the warning. These things become habit forming and your political representatives need to be very careful about the powers they are giving away to ministers. Thank you. That's, that's very interesting. I think it, I would say it's most unfortunate that, that your intervention was perhaps misunderstood by the fourth estate, fifth estate, the, the, but by the press anyway, so it came across uh, only the soundbite, a monstrous imposition. Yeah, well, I, 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 to be fair, I chose that soundbite carefully because I knew that it would catch. Yes. And if you want yes. to make a splash, it's no good making a small one. <laughs> um, so I knew, and I knew that I would attack, get, there would be huge opprobrium attached to me for saying so. You know, I had 600 emails within three days on the issue, um, happily, they began very badly, it began almost entirely um, slating me for being so selfish and horrible and wanting to infect people with COVID-19. <laughs> but by the time we got to, the, clearly those people who were outraged 
by being required to wear a face mask took some time to cotton on or some time to email but by the time after three days and I'd had 600 odd it was about 20 to 1 in favor of what I'd said so some people had clearly got the message uh, I think you know but 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 I, I don't I don't fool myself that that is a picture of public opinion. I accept entirely that most people support the government's action. But as I say, as a political representative, I have a duty also to give voice to those people who are a minority and who are opposed to what the government is doing, as no, I am. You know, I'd certainly support you in the idea that there should be due process and parliamentary scrutiny. The difficulty arises where there is genuine urgency to make a decision, which, and certainly that wasn't the case with face masks because they've had months to think about it. Exactly, they had months to think about it, but also, remember, they gave us a week. Yes. When the announcement was made, it, from next Friday, the following Friday, it will become compulsory, as indeed there was a lead time in the other, uh, the, the other impositions that were made upon us. Now, as I say, if it's done on the affirmative resolution, I'd much rather it was done by primary legislation with full debate and amendable. Where, but if you did it under affirmative resolution, at least there would be parliamentary authority for having done it, even if Parliament wasn't allowed to tweak it and amend it. Be a little careful of the cable there, Stephen. Um, uh, right, OK. Um, let's go to Maureen and then Jeremy. Maureen. I'm a bit confused by your argument about regarding libertarianism and you're talking about government and governance and the liberties that government might take. Because government, as we know, what was the last election that the Conservative Party won by? It was it 34% of the population? So... There's a flaw in that, isn't it? So it wasn't the majority of the population. Sorry, just let me get you from there. Um, uh, so, I'm not quite clear in my mind the links between those two, but can I just go back to something else that you're talking about that's maybe giving me a link in terms of what drives the government? You mentioned Mr. Re uh, Ronald Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher, and uh, I think it is fair to say that they did unleash regulationary powers for the banks mm -hmm. which was a driving force in the economic a, a huge economic driver so by the time we got to the uh, 1990s the pressure on the Blair government or what came to be the get from the city and the market was huge on Blair and Brown to continue deregulation and so it went forward with Clinton and uh, Brown, as you say, under a Blair, uh, but it was the initial drivers without that were Reagan and Thatcher. So let's do. So, sorry, let me just finish this. Maureen, we don't have much time, but just if you can be brief. So, yeah. um, what I'm trying to say is that, therefore, it was an economic driver that drove that. In terms of public health, what has driven things in terms of smoking, what's driven the government? is the tobacco companies for decades on full scientific evidence that the tobacco companies put forward completely false the government did not act and we have had millions across the world of deaths as a consequence of that and uh, furthermore on our environment we have had false scientific information coming forward so it's saying that the environmental argument is weak and therefore we haven't had the government taking the action it should have done for the population to improve climate change. So, so I think there's something... Sorry, Ma maybe. Maureen, you're, you're introducing so many topics here and we're <laughs> right up against here time. about what's the driver. Okay. And I let, think let the driver him, for let him, Mars let him is reply an economic then. driver. Okay. So the first point the question of the fairness of the electoral system. It is nevertheless the electoral system that we have, and it's the consent that we all give to it by participating in it. I'm sure we can all think of improvements to it. Someone thought of some in 2011, and we had a referendum on whether we'd keep our existing referendum system, and by a margin of 70% to 30%, we decided to keep it. 
So I'd make that point. I accept entirely there was huge liberalisation under Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, which I welcome, and I think that was hugely beneficial. But the changes that sparked the, um, the credit crunch and the immediate cause of the crisis that we experienced in 2008-2009 was a consequence of changes made subsequently. On environment and the other issues that raised, of course it's entirely proper that we maintain a free press capable of scrutinising and exposing everything that everyone is doing so that you know about it. But it doesn't. It does, pretty well. No, it doesn't. There was another question, a final well. question. Um, okay, fine. Um, Simon, you've had a go, but let's uh, let Jeremy um, have a final question. Sorry, Simon. <clears throat> Excuse me, if I stand up, but I've, I've got a back injury and it's, it's, it's more comfortable standing up. Um, I'll try to be very, very brief and specific. I'll cut you off if you're and, not. And practical <laughs> and to the point. And I'm, in, and I'm going to confine what I say to a simple suggestion, which uh, possibly um, Sir Desmond can lull please, over and spare time. Speak louder, please, please, He's leaving in 30 seconds. Stand here. Jeremy, mind your feet. <laughs> but hurry up. <laughs> I am hurrying up. Um, no, I want to make a very brief suggestion. A very, very practical. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. When you're okay. facing this way. We have a major crisis in this country, which is very, very, can be very simply described as an appalling decline in police numbers. Okay? It is absolutely tragic what has happened. Police! Yes, it's absolutely tragic what has happened to the police in the last three or four years. I'm not going to blame anybody or any administration in particular. But the simple fact is that it is an absolutely critical situation that we're in. Now, all I want to say is, and I'm not going to go on any further, is to make a suggestion as to how to address this appalling situation we're in, um, in relation to police numbers. We have so many people at the moment who are sitting at home doing virtually nothing, nothing, being subsidised by the tax taxpayer to do nothing. Um, take cabin crew, for example, from our major airlines. Okay, the, let, the, uh, I got the point. Let's let no, 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 Desmond the point. respond to the police one, and then because no, we need no, to no, let him go. No, I just want to say this very quickly. Let me finish. I mean, you're not going to go on. For this, after all, a talk on libertarianism. Is <laughs> do as they please. Go. All right. <laughs> cabin crew, in particular who are being led off in huge numbers by the major airlines, are, are ideal fodder for new, for new po police recruits. They've got experience of dealing with difficult people in confined conditions on aircraft, etc., etc. Instead of just paying these people to, to sit around at home and do nothing, for goodness sake, let's draft them into the, into the police, train them to be police, and, and therefore, in, to some extent, thereby ameliorate the drastic decline of 20,000 police that occurred two years ago. Okay. <laughs> so, so, Boris has promised us 20,000 police in this lifetime of this parliament as, uh, and has already recruited the first 5,000 of them. You're quite right to point out that this only restores us to the numbers that we had originally before we had to make such a retrenchment in public expenditure in response to the crisis that we've already had drawn to our attention, the economic crisis. But as to those people who would be most suited to become our new police force, I should like to reflect on that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>I just want to thank Sir Desmond again and Moira for coming uh, today and giving up their time for us. It's been very, very stimulating and um, no doubt we'll, we'll continue many of these discussions. But thank you very much. For being. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure and I thoroughly enjoy um, being challenged with such intelligent uh, and pressing questions. Uh, and thank you for your hospitality. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.